Major funding for Election 2014 ballot initiatives is provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to our every other year complete and thorough and totally non-biased examination of the issues that will appear on the Arkansas ballot. Yes, there will be a number of political candidates, candidates for public office, but there are also five, at least at this time of this taping, five issues to confront Arkansas voters on that very same ballot. And to help us wade through all that, to cut to the uh, bottom line as it were. Dr. Stacy McCullough, who is the chair, director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Arkansas's Division of Agriculture, the Cooperative Extension Service, and our old friend Dr. Wayne Miller, professor of uh, public policy there at the Cooperative Extension Service. The team, as we have mentioned before, storied for the absolute neutrality of, uh, of the analysis that they provide of initiatives, referendums, proposed constitutional amendments and the like. We ought to begin, I guess, Wayne, Doctor, with uh, there are still a couple of deadlines that are pertinent. And just for the benefit of our audience, we are taping on September 23rd. That could be important as will be revealed a little bit later, later in the program. But we have a couple of deadlines still remaining for the electorate to consider. Sure. Um, uh, October 20th is when early voting is going to start. And so people that don't like to be in the line that, that, that big day can go ahead and start voting at their precincts. Now keep in mind there are some areas they may have limited voting. So it's not like you can go where you, could, where you would go on election day. So. Uh, you need to check with your county clerk's office to check see exactly first. what's open. And that's the big thing. And then November 4th is the big day, the official election day. That's when everything will be calculated and figured out. All right. Now, we have uh, the whole matter of ballot position that, that we might ought to consider first, you know, how we get something on there or how these things came about. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, sure. There are a couple of ways. I mean, one, the citizens in Arkansas have the right uh, to put initiatives on the ballot. They can either initiate uh, an act or a constitutional amendment. It requires a, a bit uh, number, different number of signatures depending on whether it's a constitutional amendment or an initiated act. But citizens uh, can put uh, issues on the ballot as well as uh, the General Assembly. And the General Assembly can put up to three issues on the ballot. And this year they have put three issues on the ballot. And so there's a couple ways uh, that issues can get on the ballot. Well, let's get started here. The, what we'll call an issue, well, it is issue one to, right. uh, to uh, confront voters. Yeah, it, it sh but I might reiterate too that we are an educational institution. And so what we present today, hopefully, is taken in educational context to provide more information so we're better informed when, when we go to vote. And we're not suggesting you vote for or against any of these issues. Uh, Just for the record, on. folks, there That's it is right. again. All right. <laughs> but, but issue one, uh, it's a constitutional amendment uh, put on the ballot by the Arkansas General Assembly. And it, it's uh, primarily to allow the General Assembly uh, to approve or disprove any administrative rules propagated by the state agencies. Now, the state agencies uh, develop rules to interpret and implement uh, legislative laws uh, put on the books by the legislatures. And, and the process they've used in the past is they have to develop a rule, uh, allow 30-day comment period. Uh, they take these comments sometimes and sometimes revise the rules and submit those to the uh, Bureau uh, of Legislative uh, Research. Research. And the staff members there are basically a staff uh, for the legislators in the state. And uh, they present these rules changes uh, to the Article Legislative Council. The Legislative Council often uh, refers these to their subcommittee on the Rules and Regulations Review uh, Subcommittee who reviews the rules with state agency leaders and uh, historically they've worked together kind of thing in developing these rules, but the committee and the legislative council cannot approve or disapprove uh, of these rules. 
And I think I think that is the issue uh, being addressed here. Whether it can express approval or disapproval. Exact, but is, exactly, but they cannot enforce uh, right. approval or disapproval. Right. And in fact, that's been backed up by the state Supreme Court uh, in Arkansas, who says there's a separation of powers defined by the Arkansas Constitution. Uh, which says that the state agencies or the executive branch has the right to enforce, develop and enforce the rules uh, and the legislative uh, uh, branch uh, cannot approve or disapprove of those for the separation of powers. Well, I, th I think at least th there are enough members in the General Assembly who want this put on the ballot because they think maybe the intent of the Constitution wasn't interpreted correctly. And so therefore they're putting on, on, on the ballot uh, to let the voters decide. Uh, on, on this issue. There is opposition to the amendment within yes. government. It, 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 it is, I think it's fair to say that it is viewed uh, in some quarters anyway as an encroachment on the powers of the executive. I, I, exactly, because I mean that's what the state uh, Supreme Court has said in the, in the past, that, that it does infringe on, on the powers of the executive branch. And uh, let, me, let me go to what, what some of the opponents say here a little bit. I mean, these are not, not our statements kind of thing. We present what, what the opponents right. and proponents uh, state on these issues. And, and so uh, I, I probably need to refer to my uh, cheat sheet here. Oh, well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Full disclosure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, once they say that they would just disrupt uh, well, the supporters, would, 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 uh, Let's opponents. opponents. Okay. Opponents. The opponents say it would disrupt uh, the separation of powers between the legislators and the executive branch, uh, basically what we talked about uh, before. And they also say uh, it would make the process to establish uh, the rules more difficult and time consuming while well, legislators educate themselves about a complicated legal or technical issue in order to approve or disapprove uh, the rules. They also say that a few legislators could block implementation. Of the, of the rules and of the law uh, passed by the General Assembly by refusing to accept the rules. But it has its advocates. It does. And, Obviously. Uh, that's right. That's why it's on the ballot. <laughs> but uh, they say legislators would be able to make sure that state agency rules follow the intent of the law passed by the legislature. They say the legislator would have the final say over new rules and regulations before they go into effect, before they're allowed to cause any uh, difficulty. And th these administrators are not elected officials and, and that the power should reside in the elected officials. And so I, th I think that's oh, yeah. basically what the... But, but, but again, I mean, th these are just some of, uh, of the statements that we've collected from the supporters uh, and opponents of the legislation. Uh, more detailed information is available, of course, from the, those groups uh, who support or oppose it. And you can also go to our website, uh, click on the newsletter, and you can see links uh, to some of the, the supporter and, and opponents groups. There we go. Also, the, the very uh, manner in which we approach from a, uh, uh, either a, uh, a statutory basis or a constitutional matter. There's also a question involving that on the ballot the, for future uh, for future initiatives. Referendum per, right, issue purpose. Right. right. Uh, this is also a constitutional amendment uh, proposed by the General Assembly. Again, this is the second or the third uh, issues they're putting on the ballot. And what, what they're saying, they're not changing uh, the number of ballot signatures required to get a petition on the ballot, what they're saying is uh, for, for the initial submission, uh, what the current process is right now, there's a certain number of, of ballot uh, signatures required for a petition to be put on the ballot. Uh, organizations must uh, submit these uh, to the Secretary of State's office four months in advance of the election. And as long as uh, they have the number of required signatures on that petition, then the, S the Secretary of State will look at and determine the, the number of valid signatures uh, on the ballot. I if uh, there are not enough valid signatures on, on the ballot, right now what happens is they can go back, have additional 30 days uh, to collect more valid signatures to try to reach that minimum number that's required for them. And what, what this proposal says, if they don't have 75% of the valid signatures required to put it on the ballot, they cannot go back and get additional signatures. 
And a valid signature is just basically a signature of a registered voter. That's what they're looking for. But it's different with, depending on whether it's an act or an initiated act, a constitutional, proposed constitutional it, amendment. Well, yeah, it, it, the, the number number of valid signatures is required, uh, I think, for a constitutional amendment. It requires 10% uh, of the number of people who voted in the last governor's election. And for uh, initiated act, it requires, I think, 8%. And for a referendum, I think it's 6%. And also, you need to get a certain number of those signatures from 15 counties. Now, there has been, there, all of us is, every two years, there is always some confusion and usually some litigation or, or often some litigation involving uh, the signatures themselves. This it, it would, at a minimum, perhaps eliminate some of the confusion as to exactly how many were needed to at least meet that threshold for. Uh, a grace period, as it's sometimes called. Exactly. I mean, if, if they don't have 75 percent uh, of the valid signatures required to put it on the ballot in, in November, uh, then they're not eligible to go back and collect more signatures. Three more issues on the ballot. All three, in, right now, <laughs> as of this morning anyway, they involve a little litigation which is uh, still pending. Uh, doctor, you can take th three. Sure. Issue, issue three. Issue number three is also referred by the General Assembly. Um, it's the third, the final one that they could uh, put on there. Um, it's got five different components to it, and if you look through the legislative record, you can actually see where each part of it was originally part of maybe a separate initiative, and as they kind of fine-tuned and got to a compromise about what they would put on the ballot, um, several of these things got folded in together. So issue number three has five major components. The first deals with gifts for that could be accepted from lobbyists. The second one deals with creating an independent citizens commission, which would set um, salaries for uh, constitutional officers of the state of Arkansas, members of the General Assembly, as well as um, justices and judges across the state. Um, the third issue deals with campaign contributions um, in terms of people running for office, what they can accept and from whom. Uh, the fourth component deals with lobbying by former legislators. It sets a minimum of two years before they can register as a, as a lobbyist after getting out of office. And the last one deals with term limits, and it changes right now. Um, we have a constitutional amendment on the books that has chamber-specific term limits. So in the House of Representatives, you can serve up to three two-year terms. In the Senate, you can serve up to two four-year terms. This would eliminate those chamber-specific things and set a new limit as a, just a total of 16 years. You can serve it in any combination um, of ways that there might be. So that would expand from 12 to 4. Actually, Lincoln's by a, a third, I guess. Well, the, so it would expand 14 to 18, 14 to 16. So if you add the 8 and the 6, that would be the 14. And right. then this would extend it by two years and again it could be in either chamber. Mm -hmm. Now uh, there is some litigation. Mm -hmm. So this is one of actually three of the <laughs> issues that are on the ballot currently have court um, right. cases pending. This one is one of them. Um, it's being challenged in terms on a couple different points. One point is the ballot title. Um, by putting term limits in there, uh, there is some concern that people will assume that there aren't term limits already there. Um, and then also just the nature of the title and all the different components that are in there, there's some concern about whether or not that's going to be clear to voters as well. Well, let's just take those five components sure. and as quickly as we can. Sure. Okay, so gifts from lobbyists, it basically it would prohibit constitutional officers, so those are people like the governor, the lieutenant governor, secretary of state, uh, commissioner of lands, all the things that we elect at the state level, as well as members of the General Assembly and also this new Citizens Commission, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. It would prohibit any of them from accepting a gift from a lobbyist or someone acting on behalf of a lobbyist. And they do define gifts, and basically it's anything of value for which something of equal value hasn't been given. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, things like pamphlets or educational informational materials are not considered gifts. Um, reimbursements for travel or sending people to conferences, things from family members. So there are a number of things that aren't considered gifts. Um, the, uh, the actual proposal pretty definitely defines what gifts are and what gifts aren't. Right. And part two. Part two is the citizens, the 
Independent Citizens Commission. Commission. And so right now, under current law, the General Assembly establishes salaries for themselves um, as well as the constitutional officers. And so this would create an independent commission. Um, it would have appointees that are that are submitted from the governor, from the leaders of the House and the Senate, um, from the Supreme Court uh, Justice, the Supreme Justice, they would appoint members to this commission. And then this commission would basically do a review of all the salaries of all those constitutional officers, the members of the assembly, justices and judges across the state. Um, they could adjust what salaries are for those entities or those individuals, um, and then annually thereafter they would uh, revisit those and set what those salaries would be. Uh, the commission would also have the authority to uh, make recommendations regarding reimbursements or per diem that the legislators or some of these other officials um, receive, and so that they don't necessarily set those; they provide a recommendation to the um, still have to be funded the Senate. Yep. Yep. So that's the Citizens Commission, and there are, you know, those the people that are. There are some rules about who can serve on that. Basically, it's it's almost anybody who's, you know, a registered voter and a, a citizen and um, 24 or 25 years of age. So there are some things that defines kind of who's eligible. You can't do it if you have a conflict of interest. So you know, if you're related to a senator, you're not going to be able to serve on that uh, commission. Um, the commission can receive a stipend for their efforts. Um, and that they would set that themselves, um, but there is a limit in it uh, in the amendment, in the proposed amendment that would uh, cap that amount. So lots of things regarding that Citizens Commission, but it would be a, a completely new body within the state of Arkansas. Component three. Component three, campaign contributions. And uh, this would actually place language in our constitution that deals with campaign contributions. Right now, all of that language is statutory. Um, and it would basically prohibit anyone running for any office in the state of Arkansas, whether that's a local office or a state office, from accepting campaign contributions from anyone except for five groups. So individuals can still make campaign contributions, uh, political parties can, um, county political party committees can, uh, legislative caucus committees can still provide campaign contributions and approved political action committees could still do it. But lobbyists or other groups outside of those five things would not be able to provide those contributions. And there's more? Four. <laughs> Part four, lobbying from former legislators. And I think I already alluded to this. There's a lot jammed this. into this one. There is. Um, so basically right now in Arkansas code, uh, members of the General Assembly have to wait one year after getting out of office before they can register to become a lobbyist. This would set in our state's constitution, so again, it couldn't be changed unless voters voted to change it, uh, a two-year minimum cooling off period, if you will. So once you're out, you have to wait two years before you can then become a lobbyist. So pretty straightforward for that. And five. And five. The last and final thing deals with the term limits, and we did kind of address this. Basically, it's extending from the current level of 14 years to 16 years, and there's no um, stipulation. It can be all in the Senate or all in the House or any combination thereof. Yeah, this one is so, has become, I think everybody would agree, has kind of hypercharged anyway in terms of, which we won't get into the motivations of both sides, but there are arguments sure. that are being made. Sure. Uh, yeah, and, and vocally. Like both sides. And I think you're probably going to see more of those in the court cases, especially these that have court cases. You know, a lot of, we have to kind of prepare our information to voters fairly early in the process, and a lot of stuff comes out in that month before the election, but right. it's kind of too late for us to get all of that addressed. So I would encourage voters to kind of keep their eyes tuned, read the papers, pay attention to the news, um, seek out information about these issues, and, and find out what the most current things that are coming up related to supporting and opponent arguments are. Okay, another issue on the ballot. It will come as some surprise to a great many Arkansans that there's any part of Arkansas that is still dry, given the abundance of, of uh, the private clubs in there. But at any rate, in terms of package sales, certainly uh, there are parts. Uh, and the and issue four, I think it's fair to say we'd be pretty sweeping. It's usually done on a county by county basis. Under four, it would not. Right, I mean, basically this would overturn any county or locality specific um, laws on the books that, that, key, that make the county or parts of the county dry. So right now in Arkansas there are 37 dry counties. 
Uh, the rest are wet, but even among the wet counties, there are still 26 of those 38 um, have portions of the county where the local electorate has voted to keep to make those parts dry. Townships or... Exactly. I mean, there are several counties where you could go, you know, Logan County, for example, you can go to Paris and buy something, you go to Boonville, you can't. So um, this would basically eliminate all of that inconsistency across the state. Um, the entire state would become wet. You could buy it anywhere. Now, that doesn't mean it wouldn't be regulated. Um, the Alcohol Beverage Commission Division, something like that. <laughs> the ABC, Alcohol Arkansas Beverage. Alcohol yeah. Beverage Division, yeah. They would still be able um, to regulate to some extent, just like they do now. Um, and then there could also be zoning things that would be passed at the local level that could prohibit potentially where things could be located or hours of operation, those sort of things. Anything locally, you could still pass things as long as they don't. Um, contradict anything that would be in this constitutional And amendment. administrative regulations would still be left to the ABC? Correct. Okay, Wayne, we've got another one, and that's minimum wage, and this one's yes. getting warm. Uh, and that's an initiative act by the people of Arkansas, and it's to increase the minimum wage from the current $6.25 to eventually $8.50 over, over uh, two years. Starting January 1st, uh, 2015, it would raise to $7.50 then to $8 in 2016, and to $8.50 in 2017. And so, so I think the rationale for, for this, uh, by the sponsors say, anybody uh, that works hard and follows the rules deserves a fair wage. And uh, briefly, I, I can give you a, a quick uh, review of the minimum wage in Arkansas. It started uh, in 1969 at $1 per hour. And it's that was the first minimum wage statute in so. Arkansas. Right, the, yeah. the Arkansas State. wage was the first in 1969. It's been increased 22 times since then, and the last time was in 2006 at six dollars and 25 cents an hour. And if you compare what uh, that six dollars and 25 cents buys today versus in 2006, it would take about uh, seven dollars and 28 cents today to buy the same goods and services as it did in 2006. And, and the peak actually was, uh, I think, in 1978. It would take about $9.40 today to buy the same goods and services you could in 1978 with the minimum wage at that time. Okay. And so it's changed over time a little bit. And briefly, who would be affected by this? Uh, there are businesses, uh, workers, and I will talk a little bit about the, the general economy, employment in the general economy. Uh, as far as employ, uh, businesses, all businesses with four or more employees would be affected by this because even though the federal minimum wage right now is 725 above 625, this would raise uh, the minimum wage above the federal level and so all businesses that have four or more employees would be affected. Uh, U.S. Department of Labor says about 44,000 people, Arkansan workers in Arkansas, are, are at or under the minimum, federal minimum wage right now. So the first year, more than 44,000 people would be affected, workers would be affected. Uh, when it raised to $8.50, uh, the Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families suggested that uh, approximately 130,000 workers would be affected. That's approximately 10% uh, of Arkansas's uh, workforce. And of course, some of those would, uh, there would be people who would be indirectly affected by this uh, because of pressure on increasing wage for those above. Uh, a big question on this issue is what happens in the economy? What happens to employment uh, and the economy if you uh, raise the minimum wage? And I think th there's, uh, you know, supporters uh, of this say that it will actually increase employment and, and opponents say it will decrease employment. And so, so I think there's a growing consensus now amongst uh, economists, including five Nobel Prize uh, winners who reviewed all past academic literature on this topic. And their basic consensus is that it has little or no effect on employment and it could stimulate the economy because it would put more money into the hands of people who would spend it, creating bigger demand and more job growth. So, is that, corporate, Arkansas tip, well, uh, corporate Arkansas typically opposes, as it is in this case, I think it's fair to say, uh, uh, as inflationary and as counter to full employment. but but. To the to the matter of litigation, this one's under study as well. The Supreme Court now. Y yes, uh, I, I 
I think I heard it last night on the news uh, where it, it's <laughs> a case is being brought against this. Again, it's the timing of when the signatures were presented to the right. Secretary of State's office. July 4, July 7. What's, it, it, yeah. it, exactly, yeah. that kind of thing. And so I don't know. I mean, the state Supreme Court, I guess, will, will address uh, that issue. And a second issue, Dr. McCullough, also sufficiency of the uh, signatures submitted. Right. So there's some, yeah, they have two components. One is the deadline. The second one is, you know, there are numbers of uh, signatures that the complainant feels are suspicious and that might not be valid. So there is some question they're challenging whether they actually did have the correct number of signatures. And of course, it is beyond our knowing when the Supreme Court will uh, rule That's on right. any of the three issues that are now the. <laughs> Which is a good point. Most likely, all five of these will appear on the ballot that people vote on. Voter machines have Ballots to be. Ballots are done. I mean, they have to yeah. be. You know, they have to be programmed. You can't just change it overnight. Um, so. What will happen then is even if you vote for some, if they have been dismissed by the courts, then basically those won't be tallied at all. It'll, it'll, it'll be like they didn't exist, even though people did cast votes for or against them. Doctors McCullough, Dr. Miller, thank you very much for your time. As always, very informative and straight down the middle. Right. Thank you for your time. Vote. See you in two years. Major funding for Election 2014 AETN Debates is provided by AARP Arkansas.